Welcome to Corning, Iowa, home of the National Farmers Organization and Nottoway Valley Foods and 120 other eight fine businessmen, Corning Chamber of Commerce. This is one of the many signs of distinction that is going all across the United States with letters NFO, and cooperation is the key. This was a theme at Rural America Declaration of Independence Day by Ed Wimmer, National Federation of Independent Businessmen Public Relations Director. The theme of his speech was American Heritage. Many other outstanding leaders are praising the theme American Heritage. For example, FHA and PCA officials see the family farm threatened. An official of the Farmers Home Administration said recently, the large farming enterprises are a threat to family agriculture in this country, and the present price and market policies are cockeyed and upside down. Floyd H. F. Higby, Deputy Administrator of the organization, made the comments in a speech before a regional FHA meeting. You do not solve the farm problem by simply eliminating farmers, Higby stated. He criticized the way large corporations and monopolies have caused many people to leave the farm into the cities. He said if present trends continue, the entire nation's food supply could be controlled by fewer than 250,000 big farm operators. Another outstanding finance specialist, Mr. Homer Jackson of Rifle Colorado, a production credit official, stated that the American people should keep in mind that it has been private enterprise, not free enterprise, that has made this America gr a great nation in this world. The backbone of this country's economic structure, he stated, consists of the private enterprise spread among the millions of farmers in small towns and businessmen all over America. Mr. Jackson stressed that the economic destruction of America's farm families present a great danger to the strength of this nation and to our American way of life. Mr. Jackson concluded by saying the entire farm problem affecting agriculture credit can be explained in one word, prices and prices alone. Homer Jackson and another outstanding specialist, Floyd Higby. Here now we go to Central Park now for a speech by Ed Wimmer at Rural America Declaration of Independence Day. Governor Dan and Mr. Mayor, and my distinguished fellow Americans, because to me, the people that turn out like this to listen to what other people have to say are always distinguished. You have honored me by your presence, and I have been honored by NFO to come here today. I'd like to hear a big yell of how many of you are at Des Moines. How many were uh, in Louisville? Yeah. I'll tell you, that's wonderful. That does my heart good. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to talk about priorities and various other things that your NFO leaders are going to talk about. I'm going to try to confine my remarks today as to why we are here, where we are, and where we may be headed. This is the 4th of July. And this is the day when we are supposed to celebrate freedom. The father and son businesses and the father and son farms and the father and son banks are one of the three pillars of our American society. And we are going to have to do something and do it fast to keep these sons on the farm and keep the sons following their fathers in small businesses and other enterprises or America is going to die on Main Street. I'd like to introduce my own son, who is here with me and has decided to follow me in the work that I am doing. So far as Arnold Paulson is concerned, we'd be patting each other on the back if I was to say what I think about the crusading that he has done up and down this United States for the family farmer and for small business and for the free enterprise system and our representative form of government. It would be a long story. Until I got into the NFO picture, I didn't realize that you had men like Homer Jackson and Orrin Staley and Butch Swain and Wilkins and Fingston. In fact, Mr. Fingston came to my office to talk to me about speaking in Des Moines. And I wasn't sure what he was there for for quite some time until we had discussed 
all the different background of the different work that I'm doing and the different work that, that you are doing and that NFO is doing. And then I got acquainted with the Tempco, with Ruth Nichols. I got acquainted with Jake Owen, who was trying to get some grain alcohol going in the gasoline of the United States. And he wrote me a letter and he said, I believe that the 4th of July meeting in Corning is going to make history. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe it is too. Now, as I've gotten around the country speaking at NFO meetings, I've run into a lot of fellows that didn't join. They said, well, I'm going to wait to see what you can accomplish. You wait to see what you're going to do. Or they had some other reason. And I always look at those fellows as the guy who says, well, halitosis is better, no breath at all, and then he leaves himself go without doing anything about it. The base of operations for America's new challenge will not be New York. It will not be Los Angeles. There is too much strife and struggle. It may finalize in the halls of Congress, but it is going to begin in communities like Corning. Today we are a nation of strife, a nation of struggle, a nation of racial hatred, a nation of violence, which is stalking our land and making our headlines. But behind those riots, and behind the headlines and behind the violence is an America that absolutely nothing is going to conquer. The real hell raisers of America haven't really shown themselves yet. When they do, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, the picture is going to change. Now, we need to be reminded on this day that the patriots of our revolution put their faith in God. They took God's word as their trust, his promise as their goal. Let those who spread hate today take note of that fact. I think that we should pay a tribute to the chambers of commerce, of the small towns and the cities for that matter, but particularly the small towns, the ones that have been, con that have been con uh, cooperating with NFO, that first it was a little bit tough for the businessman, but today I find these chambers of commerce coming to life all over America and realizing that without family farms all around their towns, there is going to be no chamber of commerce. So they better get into the swim, whether they want to or not. Another thing I think that we should recognize is the wonderful way that the press and the radio and TV have covered NFO stories without trying to bury NFO. Now, there has been some bad publicity. You all know it as well as I do. But on the whole, ladies and gentlemen, I think the press and the radio and TV and everybody else deserves a real hand for the wonderful cooperation that they have put behind the story of the family farm these last several years. Now, when you think of somebody not speaking up, when you think of yourself not speaking up, when you're around in a small group and you want to talk for NFO, or you want to talk for the small businessman, or you want to stand up for the family farmer, and you say, well, they'll think I'm some kind of a nut. Well, listen to this. In Germany, they came for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, but by that time, there was no one left to speak up. Pastor Niemöller, who almost died in a concentration camp in Germany. What is the principal product of the farm? It is your children. And is there any institution, I don't care if it's as big as the Rockefeller Institution, is there any institution in the world that could take the place of the farm mother? I've been around at NFO, and my mother was a farm mother, and I know what she did in the morning, and I know what she did at night and for seven days a week, and what kind of kids she tried to raise, and I hope that maybe I might be an example of something of what she, she did. But I'll put one farm mother for efficiency or anything you want to call it against the biggest corporation farm in the United States and make it look sick.
woman power goes beyond the home, it goes into the marketplace. And woman power in America today is 280 billions of dollars of spending. And if the women of America had not been chasing trading stamps and gimmicks and games and contests, if the farmers and their wives of America had not been running to the post office to send money orders off to Sears and Roebuck, if they had been patronizing their independent merchants up and down the main streets of America, and if the main street merchants of America would put up a fight for the family farm, there wouldn't maybe any need for NFO even today if that would have been going the way it should. We've all been changed. We've all been chainized and monopolized. And whatever we do, whatever I do, whatever NFO do, does, it's all going to be wasted if we can't find an answer to the monopoly problem in America. And my theme in Des Moines was this, that the shot heard at Concord Bridge was heard around the world, and the shot that was fired at Des Moines was heard in the White House, and it blew the locks off of the doors of every single congressman. When I left Des Moines, Des Moines, I had a feeling that veteran halls in Des Moines was Iowa's own Independence Hall, a 1967 agricultural Declaration of Independence was written on that day. And I say this because before Des Moines, when I would go into the congressman's office and they would say, well, the little farmer's going to have to go. And then I would go to some other people and some economists and they would say, well, after all, the buggy whip is gone and the, and the covered wagon is gone and the Model T is gone. Now you just can't hang on to those things. But after Des Moines, and after Louisville, where I come from down near there, the story began to change. And you'll remember that the president started issuing statements out of the White House, and Humphrey and Freeman and all of them started traveling across the country. I got a telegram here from uh, John Kyle, one of your congressmen out here. And he says, as one who has worked side by side with you in trying to preserve the independent business and the small farms of America, I thank you for coming to Iowa. July 4th is the best day of the year for your speech because the independence of the individual is the genuine value of the American way of life. At Des Moines and all over the nation, I am saying to the family farmers and to the small businessmen of America that you have not analyzed your position or your importance. When you can stand up and look in the mirror, when you can turn the key in the door of your small business, when you can get up in the morning to go out and milk your cows or whatever else you're doing, and you can know that when you are gone, the American way of life is gone, that there is no American heritage, no country left, then you've got something different to fight for than tractors and barns and a few extra profits and maybe to keep your kids on the farm. Now, since this is Declaration Day, and since Thomas Jefferson, if the world today understood the life and the story and the teaching and the philosophy of Thomas Jefferson, do you think we'd be in Vietnam? Do you think there would be a wall between East and West Germany? Do you think there would be a communist threat anywhere in the world if the life would, of Thomas Jefferson was known? And do you know that it isn't even known to 90% of our kids in our schools and colleges? And then we're going out over the world like a meddling old bumbling uncle to try to tell the rest of the world what the American way of life is when our teachers and our kids and our colleges don't even know what it is. Now, Thomas Jefferson said, it is not to the advantage of a republic that a few should control the many when nature has scattered so much talent through the conditions of men. And James Madison, 30 years old, hold fast to programs rational and moral that have as their central goal a constant diffusion of power. And today we are the most power-ridden nation that the world has ever known since the days of Rome. And we are going exactly down the same path that Britain took. Do you think you could have told a, an Englishman 35 or 40 years ago that there wouldn't be a single Englishman anywhere in the world singing Britannia Rules the Waves? Of course you couldn't. He'd have thought it was the biggest joke on earth. But you don't hear any Englishman singing it today. 
And ladies and gentlemen, it is going to be our fault if someday instead of singing God Bless America, we're on our knees praying God Save America. Now my position is that this country was built on widespread My position is that this country was built on widespread independent ownership of farm, home, and business enterprise wherever practical and possible with local control over local affairs in government. This is a big country. We need big business and we couldn't get along without big business. We're going to have some big farms and there's nobody objecting to some big farms. We're going to have big labor unions, don't you ever forget it, they're here to stay. Big banks and we're going to have big government. But when cutthroat competition and mergers and consolidation and rigging of farm prices, when all of those things enter into a picture of developing gigantic corporate farms, gigantic corporate businesses, gigantic labor unions and gigantic government, I say to you on this day when we celebrate a republic that there is no room in a republic for monsters or for giants in any field. I would not be here today and pleading this cause if I thought that you were asking for anything that you are not entitled to. If I thought that your campaign was a selfish campaign to just help the farmers and not be worried about the small businessmen of the future or America or the boys at Vietnam, do you think that I would be away from my two grandsons in Covington, Kentucky today that wanted me to go out to Coney Island with them and spend the day with them? You know that I wouldn't. Nothing would be worth taking away from that if this is what this meeting was called for. In 16 years, the farmers of America have been underpaid by 422 billions of dollars, which is the greatest subsidy that was ever made by this country or the people of the world at any time in history. That's where the subsidy lies, is the subsidy to the towns and the cities, not the subsidies of the towns and the cities to the farmers. Now, what about your young people? How many of them want to stay on the farm? They come up to me in these meetings as I go around the country and they say, Mr. Wimmer, do you really think we should stay on the farm? And then I have the young people come up to me after I talk to organizations, business organizations, and they say, my dad has told me to go get another job because he doesn't believe there's a future for our shoe store or our hardware store or whatever the case might happen to be. And I say to you today out there, that a society in which the young people have lost their boldness and sense of adventure and their zest for exploration and risk-taking is a society that's going on the rocks. Now, what about this unity that we have today among the small businessmen and among the family farmers and the local bankers? Shall it be said in the future, they inherited not the American dream, but the forgotten dream? Shall it be said five years from now that instead of three million family farms, we have maybe 500,000 or a million at the most? And I went into one of those complacent towns in Minnesota. There were 22 empty stores on the main street. 200 farmers were gone. Both doctors had left the town. The dentist was packing up to leave. Two churches were consolidating. Two schools were consolidating. It was a ghost town. And when that happens all over America, America will be a ghost America. Now, Parade Magazine said, if the house divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And then they went on to say how labor, business, agriculture, government, and banking must get together in a common cause to save the little guy. Now, this was Parade Magazine. This wasn't Orrin Stanley or Finkston or, or Butch Swaim. This was, nor Ed Wimmer or Paulson. This was Parade Magazine that if they don't get together, they'll hang. Well, our National Federation of Independent Business has a quarter of a million members. And we've been fighting for the family farm since 1932, right along with the family business. The National Association of Retail Druggists have come out for the NFO program. The National Independent Bankers Association sounds more like farmers than they sound like bankers. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is progress. 
And if you will walk into your stores as farmers and start trading with your independent merchants and start telling them where you stand and quit chasing after all those trading stamps and gimmicks and contests and all the rest of the things that the chains are offering, and don't you forget for one single minute that the reason that the family chicken farms are all gone from the highways of America is because the chain stores have been using chicken as a bait for 40 years. The reason that the farm, the turkey farmers are gone in, in Wisconsin, 10,000 of them, is because when the turkey raisers brought their turkeys to town, the chains were selling them below the cost of raising them. And whether it is potatoes or whether it is strawberries or tomatoes on the Rio Grande or whether it is cattle or what it is, you can put yourself down today and maybe I'm going a little bit too far even for NFO, I don't know. I don't think so. But you put yourself down right today that monopoly power and chain storeism in America is public enemy number one, and I'm considering it along with the racial riots. There are some people who don't believe that. They always remind me of the guy that didn't believe in flying saucers until he pinched a waitress, and then he changed his mind real fast. There's another big chain that's going to open up in the United States. It's going to be backed by Gulf Oil by some of the other biggest corporations in the United States, and they call themselves the National, let me get this, the National Farm Stores. There's no more farm to it other than they're going to sell farm products, and they're going to open up gigantic shopping centers in all strategic points, and they're going to sell everything that the farmer needs from automobiles, tractors, on down to insurance, and everything else. And they're going to open up these great big shopping centers all over America. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you better start thinking about it pretty fast. Now, nature gave man two ends, one to sit on, one to think with. What happens to him depends on which end to use the most. And on this July 4th, Freedom's Holiday, a day to honor the men who lived, fought, and died for freedom. July 4th, the day when you spell out a word that gives meaning to our lives, meanings to the teachers and the sacrifices, the honor and the greatness of human life, the word freedom under God. Last week, 186 boys were killed in Vietnam. 10,000 since January the 1st. And when you look at that flag and you look at yourselves and your families and you ask yourselves, if we kill 10,000 young men in, Amer in Vietnam since January the 1st to make this country safe for the chain store monopolists and the giant business and the selfish labor leaders and these racists that are stirring up all this fire and trouble and riots in this United States and claiming they've had no freedom. How do you go home and forget the obligations of this day? How do you forget that five signers of the Declaration, for example, who were captured by the British as traitors were tortured and shot? Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned, and nine were killed in battle. Two lost their sons in the war. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter, saw his ship swept away by the British Navy. He sold his home and property to pay his debts, and he died in utmost poverty. Lest we forget, lest those merchants, business, and professional men and farmers of today forget, the ones who refused to sacrifice a few dollars to save what was won in those terrible days lest they forget, I would remind them that Thomas McKean, a signer little known of our day, a signer of the Declaration, was hounded by the British so much he had to move his family constantly. He served in Congress without pay. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his final reward. Ladies and gentlemen, compare this kind of a sacrifice of Jim Hart who came home to find his 13 children vanished and never found them again. His property laid waste. He lived in caves and forests. A few weeks after he returned home, he died of a broken heart, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. How old were these men? We talk today about the frustration of our youth. We see them marching and throwing bottles. And look what happened in Minneapolis last night when George Wallace was over there and made his feet. A terrible thing to look at. But don't you sell those kids of ours short because 90% of them back there have got their eyes open 
and their hearts open and their minds open and they want a decent, honorable America. They don't know just for sure how to go about getting it. But I think the leaders of NFO knows how uh, to go about getting it. I think that some of our candidates know if they'll speak up and say so. And I hope that our organization knows, but listen to these ages. Alexander Hamilton, 19 years old when he signed the Declaration of Independence. James Monroe, 18. Aaron Burr, who later was killed by Ham Hamilton in a duel, was only 20. James Madison, who came to warn about future Americans to hang on to their programs, rational and moral, and keep power down. James Madison was 25, and Thomas Jefferson was 33. It is their lives. It is their sacrifices. It was their revolution that we are supposed to be celebrating here today. And in closing, ladies and gentlemen, what could I say to you except to wish you Godspeed home, to listen to the words of Samuel Foss, who said, <clears throat> bring me men to watch my valleys, bring me men to watch my plains, men with dreams to match their courage and with victories in their veins. A free society, ladies and gentlemen, is tough to build. It's tough to hold. It's tougher to recapture if it gets away. Ours will get away if the ideals and fundamental principles of the Founding Fathers, the aims and the purposes of NFO in all of its statements and all of its writings and its work, if we can't find a, a way, ladies and gentlemen, to make those come true, I will guarantee you that the book that was written about 1984, that there would nothing be left of the American heritage by that day, it will happen much sooner. God bless you. God bless America. And as I said before, watch out for your kids because they're the most valuable possession that we've got. Thank you very, very much. Mr. Ed Wimmer, Public Relations Director for the National Federation of Independent Businessmen, brought out that cooperation among the organization forces to save rural America. The National Federation of Independent Business, the National Independent Bankers Association, and other organizations like the National Association of Retail Druggists, and the National Independent Food Dealers Association, and hundreds of local Chamber of Commerces now rallying behind the cause of rural America, he stated, fighting for the family farm, fighting to save independent business, fighting to save America, he said. The cooperation can save the private enterprise system and our representation form of government. This is democracy in action. Mr. Wimmer said, if, three, if there was ever a time in American history, the time is now to stand up and be counted and heard, whether you're a farmer, a rancher, a businessman on Main Street, a doctor or a lawyer or a minister or even a teacher. All America has a greater things at stake, he said, which lies outside the city limits. The businessman he called on the farms and ranches. For the income pattern of agriculture, he said, sets the true prosperity level of the nation. It appeared in the Dunn's Review, the vanishing farmer challenged to the economy, pointed out that no one can truly answer the question where the economy will end. But in this age of the draining gold reserve, a dollar under fire, an unbalance of payments, a historical simile might be worth keeping in mind. America always has prospered when agriculture has prospered. And agriculture itself has prospered when U.S. has a high level of exports. As history has shown, when agriculture has received true, honest equity, cost of production plus a reasonable profit, it has led to a strong and stable dollar. For the men who make policies in Washington, as well as the men in corporate headquarters, which are now far removed from the rural parts of this country, the link between a prosperous farm and a strong dollar bears consideration. 